and gentlemen, I'm Steve Cheney, CEO of the American Security Project. I'm welcome to ASP. If you're not familiar with ASP, we're a 501c3 nonprofit, and we take on national security issues from a, a nonpartisan perspective. We were founded in 2006 by Senators Hagel, uh, Kerry, Rudman, and Hart, and Governor Christine Todd Whitman, who all remain on our board today. And one of the points, the points they raised then, and it's still pertinent today, a lot of these issues, the minute anyone mentions them, get painted one way or the other, Republican, Democrat. Uh, we tend to feel that they should get painted in the perspective of national security. And you will see we have a number of our publications outside that uh, we, we study all of them. Energy security, nuclear security, climate change, American competitiveness, asymmetric operations, terrorism, uh, among others. So I would encourage you to get on our website and look at them and, and see what we do and take take it from the perspective that we put it in there. We put out the facts. We don't balance it one way or the other. Um, today is particularly topical, and we're so pleased to have Rose Gottmiller here. Let me lay out a little a few ground rules for us here. As you can tell, C-SPAN is here, and they're going to televise it for us. Uh, Rose will get up and talk for 15 or 20 minutes, I presume, uh, and then we'll have a Q&A, and so as to lend dignity to what would otherwise be a vulgar brawl, I will choose who will speak, and we'll have a mic over on that side of the room, so you'll have to come over and queue up to the mic. When you ask a question, please identify yourself. Try to keep it uh, a little bit short. We're here to listen to Rose and not necessarily to you, so um, if you would do that, we can get as many people in as we can. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with Rose Gottmiller. Uh, in February, she was designated as Acting Undersecretary for Arms Control, and in this month, the President announced his intent to nominate Rose to be the Undersecretary for Arms Control and International Security. Uh, what wonderful news this is for our country, especially considering, Rose, what you've done for us uh, in regards to New START, uh, the P-5, working uh, conventional forces in Europe, and working with Russia. We know that you are a tireless worker and an advocate in the United States' interest abroad uh, and a great leader here in Washington, and I know you work across the aisle for, with both Republicans and Democrats. Uh, timely today, because it's been 20 years since we've conducted a nuclear test, uh, a lot has happened since. Uh, we've created the Stockpile Stewardship Program. We've signed the CTBT, yet to be ratified, uh, developed our own nuclear test monitoring systems. Rose is going to give us her views on where we are now, some 20 years since our last nuclear test. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Rose Gottmann. Thank you very much, General Cheney. It's a great pleasure to be here today. This is the second time I've had the opportunity to, uh, to speak uh, on this podium, and it's a great pleasure to be back. There's always a very, a very knowledgeable audience in this room, and so I'll look forward very, very much to our discussions. 20 years ago, this past Sunday, the United States conducted its last underground nuclear explosive test. The test, called Divider, was followed by an official moratorium on explosive testing that uh, was put in place less than 10 days later. Over the past two decades, the United States has developed the capability to ensure the safety, security, and reliability of its stockpile through the use of state-of-the-art technology and research while maintaining a moratorium on nuclear testing. NMSA Administrator Thomas D'Agostino commented on the anniversary this past weekend. Tom said, in April 2009, President Obama shared his vision of a world without nuclear weapons. As we work toward that goal, we have the world's leading scientific facilities, the world's fastest computers, and the world's brightest minds working to ensure that we never again have to perform nuclear explosive testing in the United States. The effort that Tom D'Agostino describes entails a number of programs and tools that work together to maintain a safe, secure, and effective nuclear stockpile in the absence of underground nuclear testing. They include the Stockpile Stewardship Program, run by the National Nuclear Security Administration, which maintains the continued safety, security, and reliability of the nation's nuclear weapons in the absence of nuclear explosive testing. A key goal of the SSP is to increase scientific understanding of how nuclear devices perform, as well as the aging behavior of weapons materials and components to ensure a safe and effective nuclear deterrent. 
Second is the Life Extension Program, often called LEP or LEPs. They extend the service life of the current weapons in the stockpile by using only nuclear components based on previously tested designs, thereby eliminating the need to conduct nuclear explosive testing. NNSA, in coordination with the Department of Defense, also performs alterations and modifications to the stockpile in order to sustain the warheads that underpin the U.S. nuclear deterrent. Advanced simulation and computing capabilities provide greatly increased confidence in the ability to model and evaluate the performance and safety of nuclear weapons without nuclear explosive testing. Computers have become at least 100,000, that again, at least 100,000 times more powerful, and modern integrated design codes now more realistically capture the behavior of real nuclear devices. Enhanced surveillance tools and models play critical roles in providing information essential to assessing weapon safety, security, and performance changes that would affect the military effectiveness of our weapons. The use of data from surveillance of our nuclear weapons enables us to predict how the weapons will perform over time without using underground nuclear testing. The annual assessment process of the U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile is the authoritative method for the DOD and NNSA to evaluate the safety, reliability, performance, and military effectiveness of the nuclear weapons stockpile, and it is our principal tool. It gives us an ability to maintain a credible nuclear deterrent without nuclear explosive <coughs> testing. Finally, infrastructure modernization is being conducted in accordance with the nuclear posture. <coughs> NNSA has identified a path for sustaining the nuclear deterrent while modernizing the supporting infrastructure without nuclear explosive testing. This modernization is implemented by focusing on recapitalization and refurbishment of existing infrastructure for plutonium, uranium, tritium, high explosive production, non-nuclear component production, high fidelity testing, and waste disposition. So it's a very thorough, from cradle to grave kind of approach. All of these programs will be described in greater length in fact sheets that the State Department and NNSA put together. We're handing out copies of the first of these fact sheets today. Uh, so it's a kind of advanced, but we will be putting out on our website over the coming weeks uh, a comprehensive series of fact sheets on the Stockpile Stewardship Program. The last U.S. explosive nuclear test is not the only anniversary that is happening this week. Sixteen years ago, this Monday, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty was opened for signature, and the United States signed the treaty on the very same day. U.S. ratification of the CTBT is in our national security interest. As stated in the April 2010 U.S. Nuclear Posture Review, ratification of the CTBT is central to leading other nuclear weapon states toward a world of diminished reliance on nuclear weapons, reduced nuclear competition, and eventual nuclear disarmament. Since we have maintained a 20-year moratorium on explosive nuclear testing, our policies and practices are consistent already with the central prohibitions of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. But ratification of the CTBT would be a significant affirmation of the importance that the United States attributes to the international nonproliferation regime. More importantly, by hastening the day that the treaty enters into force, U.S. ratification would concretely contribute to reducing the role of nuclear weapons in international security. With a global ban on nuclear explosive tests, states interested in pursuing nuclear weapons programs would have to either risk deploying weapons uncertain of their effectiveness or face international condemnation for conducting nuclear tests. The CTBT would also subject suspected violators to the threat of intrusive on-site inspections, a further deterrent to those states tempted to carry out nuclear testing in the hope that it can be covered up. It has been 12 years since the Senate voted against ratification of the treaty. This administration has been reviewing the lessons learned, and it is clear that the lack of support stemmed from concerns regarding the verifiability of the treaty and our ability to ensure the continued safety and reliability of America's nuclear deterrent without nuclear explosive testing. As I've already outlined with regard to our nuclear deterrent, our extensive surveillance methods and computational modeling under the Stockpile Stewardship Program over the past 15 years have allowed our nuclear experts to understand how nuclear weapons work and age even better 
than when nuclear explosive testing was conducted, as our national laboratory directors have affirmed to the vice president. The treaty's verification regime has also grown exponentially over the last decade. Today, the International Monitoring System, or IMS, is roughly 85% complete, and when fully completed, there will be IMS facilities in 89 countries spanning the globe. At entry into force, the full body of technical data gathered via the International Monitoring System will be available for verification purposes to all states' parties. The system is already at work. It detected two nuclear explosive tests announced by North Korea and its capabilities will continue to improve as the system is completed. In addition, with the Fukushima nuclear crisis, we have seen the utility of the IMS for non-verification related purposes, such as tsunami warnings and tracking radio, radioactivity from reactor accidents. Entry into force also will bring to bear the option for on-site inspection, which will help to clarify ambiguities regarding any potential nuclear test. Taken as a whole, the treaty's robust verification regime, which supplements our own state-of-the-art verification capabilities for monitoring, our national technical means, all of these will severely challenge any state trying to conduct militarily significant explosive nuclear tests and trying to escape detection. As we look toward ratification of the CTBT, we acknowledge that the process will not be easy. That said, the new START ratification process in which I was uh, deeply involved reinvigorated interest in the topic of nuclear weapons and arms control on Capitol Hill. I'm optimistic that interest will continue as we engage the members and their staffs on this important treaty. I like to think of our efforts thus far as a kind of information exchange. We are working to get the facts out to members and their staffs, many of whom have never dealt with this treaty. We know that the key underlying issues are very technical in nature, and we want people to absorb and understand the rationale behind it, that the treaty is in the U.S. national security interest. There are no set time frames to bring the treaty to a vote, and we are going to be patient, but we will also be persistent. To aid in further understanding the treaty, the administration commissioned a number of classified and unclassified reports, including an updated national intelligence estimate and an independent assessment by the National Academy of Sciences to assess the ability of the United States to monitor compliance with the treaty and the ability of the United States to maintain, in the absence of nuclear explosive testing, a safe, secure, and effective nuclear arsenal so long as these weapons exist. Those reports and related materials will provide a wealth of information as the Senate considers the merits of ratification of the CTBT. Of course, we do not expect people to be in a receive-only mode. We anticipate and look forward to many substantive questions and uh, items of discussion and debate that will undoubtedly come from our colleagues on Capitol Hill. Looking outward, the administration has been calling on all the remaining Annex II states to join us in moving forward toward ratification. There is no reason for them to delay their own ratification processes waiting for the United States to ratify. This administration realizes that this will be a difficult task on many levels, but it is nonetheless committed to moving this treaty forward since the national security of the United States and all states will be enhanced when the CTBT enters into force. With that, I thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to your questions and our discussion. Thank you very much. Those great comments, uh, appreciate them. And as moderator, I'm going to take the privilege of asking the first question. When you look back at how hard it was uh, getting New START through, and of course, ASP, as I mentioned, is nonpartisan, but we see certainly tremendous national security advantages to New START. And we also see them to the Law of the Sea Convention, and we certainly see it to CTBT. Uh, but it, it seems like it's turned into almost a purely partisan fight, that it's, it's not a matter of the advantages, disadvantages of the treaty. It's a matter of giving a victory to a Democratic administration. Uh, do you see any hope, one, in the lame duck session, that there's a possibility it could even be considered? And secondly, how, what kind of a timeline would you lay out over the next year or two if it doesn't come up in the lame duck? 
Well, let me take, first of all, the general question. Uh, I did uh, work very hard on New Star ratification, as many of you are aware, many of you around this room participated in that process. And I actually found, working with senators on both sides of the aisle, that they took their national security responsibilities very, very seriously. They really dug down deep to understand the technical details of the verification regime of the New START Treaty, the implications for our national nuclear deterrent. They really wanted to understand. And I can um, see, and I hope, for that same, uh, that same approach to the CTBT, that uh, they will see it as a matter of our uh, national security and something that they really dig down deep to try to understand. So whereas it's no secret to anybody around uh, Washington or around this room that there is uh, a lot of partisanship on Capitol Hill, nevertheless, I've seen myself in the new START ratification process a, a, a situation where both sides of the aisle came together and worked very hard to understand the uh, national security benefits of the treaty and to bring it forward across the finish line and give the advice and consent so that the treaty could enter into force. So uh, I see uh, no reason why we can't pursue the same effort with the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It is, as I said in my remarks, a very, very complex treaty, many, many difficult technical issues, and I think for many around town, they haven't really engaged with it uh, for uh, over a decade now. So it's important to take time, study the details, try to understand, uh, as I said, dig down deep to get some technical understanding of what the treaty is all about, and to debate and discuss the questions that arise. So I see no reason why we can't, uh, why we can't have that kind of, of discussion. But it will take time. It will take time, and that's why I also said in my remarks, we're not setting out a timeline here for bringing the treaty uh, to a vote, but rather want to go through a careful process and ensure that uh, everybody understands what the treaty is all about and that it is to our uh, advantage. Got a love and optimist. The, uh, <laughs> all right, as I mentioned on the questions earlier that it, uh, we're gonna have a microphone over here on the side, and if you could please, I'll point it. Who wants to ask a question? Let me, let me throw that out there. Are there any questions or have we stunned you into silence? I see one over here. If you could please come over to the microphone on the side and queue up and uh, state your name and uh, a brief question, we'll attempt to let Rose answer it. Need a longer microphone for it. Yes. I am Kathy Crandall Robinson with Women's Action for New Directions. Um, thank you so much, Rose, for being here and for your leadership on this issue. I am wondering, uh, I uh, understand your patient and yet persistent strategy and I'm wondering if you can give us some thoughts on how um, the American public and particularly the women who are members of my organization and a number of others who have long struggled for a nuclear test ban treaty, what role should we play? Well, I really valued uh, the public involvement that we had in the process uh, of ratification of the New START Treaty. I do think the fact that the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is a very a complicated document with uh, a history all of its own will require even more careful and extensive work uh, with uh, public and interest groups around the country. So I very much welcome, frankly, the kind of partnership that we had on the New START Treaty and would like to see it extended and strengthened as we proceed forward in working on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. I think there are some slightly different interests uh, at play. A uh, new start uh, was in, in some ways a little bit uh, maybe, how shall I put it, uh, matters of nuclear deterrence are, are way out there for a lot of people. They can't get their arms around them. But in the case of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, we have some actual uh, issues that affect public communities around the country in the West, the downwinder uh, issues for some of the states out there, for Nevada, for, for Utah, for example. So I think there are ways that we connect, can connect uh, more intensively in some ways than uh, with the New START Treaty, which people saw as in U.S. overall national security interest, but didn't quite, I think, connect at a community level. So I see some new opportunities with the CTBT, and once again, Kathy, we'll really look forward to working with you and uh, your organization and others uh, who uh, are great partners for these, these types of, uh, of efforts. Thank you. Yes, sir, you're over in the back. 
very much. Uh, Daryl Kimball, Arms Control Association. Uh, uh, Secretary Gutmuller, you mentioned uh, many of the technical changes since the last uh, consideration of the, the treaty in 1999. Uh, tomorrow, foreign ministers are going to be meeting in New York uh, to meet to discuss ways to accelerate the entry into force of this treaty. What is your uh, take? What is your assessment of how the treaty is viewed by our allies, uh, most of which support the treaty. Um, what is the level of global support for the Tuscan Treaty today relative to uh, back in 1996 when it was open for signature? What effect would U.S. action have on strengthening the global effort uh, to stop the spread of nuclear weapons? Well, I always believe that the United States has a significant influence on all aspects uh, of uh, global non-proliferation and arms control policy were, uh, were one of the big dogs, after all. And I still like to remind everybody that we and the Russian Federation still have over 90% of the weapons in the world. So I think it is incumbent on us and the Russians to take some uh, special responsibility for both nuclear reductions, but also for working uh, to strengthen and uh, develop in positive ways the non-proliferation regime. So we will continue uh, to take those responsibilities very, very seriously here in Washington. Uh, I know that uh, for a fact. But the uh, particular issues, by the way, I will be up there tomorrow for the event at the United Nations. It's a very important uh, event that will, uh, for one thing, take stock of where we are with, uh, with the ratification processes for the treaty. There were some major countries in the past year that uh, completed their ratification processes, Indonesia, for example. So those countries, their foreign ministers, will have the opportunity to speak and to talk about their, uh, in this sense, progress with the ratification. Uh, there will also be opportunities for, for all uh, ministers to reflect on where we go from here. And so I'm glad to have the opportunity to be there and, and uh, lend, my, lend my support to the effort, but also uh, hear what others, others have to say. As far as um, what is going on in the rest of the world, I, I did want to reiterate again the point I made at the outset. I am telling other countries, don't sit on your hands and wait for the United States. I think there's this, this sense out there that the U.S. has to go next and that that then will drive progress forward. I agree with that. I think that uh, when the United States ratifies the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, it will drive progress forward and other states will step, step up to the bar and uh, complete their ratification processes. But I'm also telling states not to wait, that they should go ahead and complete uh, their legislative process and, and move forward on ratification of the, of the treaty. So we will continue, I think, to underscore that message because I think it is an important one. The United States led some special momentum, but we're not the only ones. All states, as they participate in the ratification efforts, uh, drive this process forward. So we'll continue to uh, to encourage that message overall. Next question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, Kenny Fletcher with Nuclear Weapons and Materials Monitor. Uh, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about the modernization debate in Congress and how that could affect uh, chances for ratification. Uh, especially, you know, are you worried that if you don't get full modernization funding, it could endanger chances for ratification? Thanks. There's no question we're going to have to work with uh, Congress uh, in order to ensure that uh, the requests that are put forward by the National yeah. Nuclear Security Administration, by the administration overall, for the infrastructure modernization piece of this, as well as for the stockpile stewardship program, that that funding. Um, is, uh, is forthcoming. Uh, we've got a very complicated situation on uh, Capitol Hill right now with the so-called fiscal cliff approaching. We've got the problem of sequestration looming out there. All of these issues are in front of us, so the message that I'd like to really underscore is one of deep partnership between the executive branch and the legislative branch to try to get through all of these wickets. Uh, it's a very, very difficult uh, fiscal situation right now, and budget austerity is, uh, is staring all of us in the face. But the president has been very clear, and he has uh, really emphasized the priority on ensuring the funding for infrastructure modernization 
and also for the science-based stockpile stewardship program. And uh, he's been clear in that commitment. So we, are, we will continue to drive forward uh, with our efforts to get the budget that we need for those, uh, those two goals. But we're going to need some close partnership with uh, our colleagues on Capitol Hill to actually make it happen. Yes, ma'am. Kate Brandon Politico. I was wondering if you could um, outline whether or not you see uh, some key policy differences here with the Obama administration and a potential Romney administration um, and what this treaty could have in store for it uh, if Obama doesn't win a second term. Thank you. Well, you know, this treaty, as I've said time and time again, uh, is in U.S. national security interest. I think it's worthwhile emphasizing two points about that. The first point to emphasize is the one that I made in my remarks today, which is about the added burden that this treaty, when in force, will place on a country attempting to cheat. They will face on-site inspection. They will face the full force of the CTBT verification regime. And so it really, really uh, ups the level of uh, uncertainty for any country that is considering cheating. And I think that's very important. The second important point about the national security interests of this treaty are that it will really place a significant block in the way of uh, further nuclear arms racing. And we are concerned about countries, particularly in Asia, uh, developing new nuclear weapons capabilities. So it places a significant block in the way of that. And the third point I'd like to emphasize is that for 20 years, our national law and policy have lived with the constraints of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in any event. So why don't we get the advantage of it by bringing the treaty into force and holding other countries around the world to the same standards? So I think those, those three points are very important ones to remember. And so for anybody in the White House, whether from the Republican or the Democratic side of the aisle, those national security interests, I hope, will come into play and uh, be determinative in what decisions they will take about the treaty. But I'm no um, magician. I can't predict the future in that regard. Yes, sir. Kramer of Physics Today. Uh, you mentioned that the, uh, the treaty is very complex. I'm wondering if you could expand on, on the complexity aspect and, and also whether the text of the treaty has had to be changed since 1996 to reflect all the new verification methods. No, the, the verification um, methods in the treaty are uh, in the treaty, and in fact, uh, I think that uh, it has stood well the test of time since it was negotiated in, uh, in the mid to late 90s. I see people around the room who are actually involved in the negotiation process, and uh, really I think it is uh, a, great, a great tribute to uh, the multilateral community that is expert in this area because it, it does have a great deal of uh, expertise and experience folded into it uh, from our on-site inspection practice, but also work that we had done uh, previously, uh, for example, with uh, the, at that time, Soviet Union, some verification experiments that we did you know, back during the course of working on the treaty. So there was a great deal of both expertise and experience that was folded into the treaty. Uh, as, uh, as it was negotiated. So I think it has borne very well the test of time, uh, to be honest. And uh, I think uh, that is why I keep emphasizing that it will be important to get it into force so that we can get the full advantages of it. Good question, Andy. Next question. Yes, sir. Okay, Teplitz, uh, uh, along the um, I was wondering uh, two things. One about the uh, larger picture of arms control over the next four years, uh, we're assuming events in the uh, favorable. Um, what, uh, if there's something, if there's an agenda and how you see the pieces falling into place. And the other specific thing is uh, one thing we faced that's sort of inexorable is the progress of technology. Of, um, 
It's good to see you. A uh, picture of arms control over the next uh, next four years. Uh, from the perspective of President Obama, he's made no secret of the fact uh, with his so-called Prague Initiative that he's uh, eager to pursue continued step-by-step -step, uh, reductions in uh, nuclear weapons. And so that is uh, one priority goal uh, for this administration. It is a uh, goal, by the way, that's uh, laid out in the preamble to the New START Treaty. So it is a goal that the Russian Federation and the United States have both articulated. So I think that we will be looking for ways to accomplish those further reductions. The President, the day he signed the New START Treaty, laid out three goals uh, for the next round of negotiations. He said we want to seek reductions in non-strategic nuclear weapons, that's tactical nuclear weapons, non-deployed nuclear weapons, that's weapons held in storage facilities, and for the reductions in deployed nuclear weapons. Now, a lot of people don't realize it, but two of those three categories are new to the arms reduction process. We've never tried to tackle non-strategic nuclear weapons, nor non-deployed nuclear weapons. We've always gone after weapons that are deployed on their delivery vehicles. So a warhead on an ICBM, on an intercontinental ballistic missile, is a deployed weapon. And that's what we have always counted and reduced, because that's what you can see even from uh, overhead satellites, from our own national technical means. So it's important to recognize that the next stage of arms control that President Obama has laid out is, uh, is uh, very ambitious and will, I think, require us to take a good look at verification technologies and how we conduct inspections and monitoring. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a significant challenge, but I think, frankly, we've arrived at a point uh, with a great deal of experience we've accumulated over the last 40 years. We've arrived at a point where we can begin to tackle some of those more ambitious tasks on the nuclear arms control front. Here, and some of you have heard me talk about it before, here I think uh, technological change can be our friend. Uh, I think there has been so much progress uh, in uh, the information revolution, for example, that we should be looking at new ways to monitor and verify treaties where we can be helped by some of the tools provided to us by the information revolution, but that's not what the speech is about today. Anyway, in that case, I think new technologies can be our friends, but also, and this has been the case throughout history, there's always uh, a technological driver moving uh, the, the kind of uh, weapons offense, defense um, balance forward. So we are looking for ways, obviously, to work uh, in cooperative uh, ways with our partners, and that includes the Russian Federation. We're looking for ways to uh, work with rather than uh, in, uh, in opposition. And so I think we're going to continue to try to develop that, that type of agenda going forward as well with, uh, with allies and partners around the world. And finally, an area that I wanted to stress, which many of you I don't think have paid much attention to for a long, long time, it's been very much on the back burner because it's been quietly successful, and that is conventional arms control. I think uh, there is a necessity out there to uh, look hard at conventional arms control in Europe and consider very precisely what we need today. The Conventional Arms Control in Europe Treaty was a great success, resulted in the destruction of 72,000 pieces of treaty-limited equipment. That's the kind of uh, overhang from the Cold War. Well, we've gotten rid of that now. CFE's been a quiet success. So what do we need now? What do we need now to bolster security, predictability, and mutual confidence in Europe? And so that's another area that we will be looking at uh, over the next uh, several years. So I think it's a multifaceted uh, agenda, but the last point I'd like to stress about this is that we are trying to look beyond what we have done in the past and the approaches that we have taken in the past and try to incorporate uh, some of the, uh, the new technologies, as I mentioned, but also some of the advances in cooperation and mutual policy over uh, the last 40 years. The reason I've frequently cited for the success of the New START treaty negotiations, and the treaty, by the way, is being 
very well implemented now. It's moving forward, you know, very smoothly in its implementation. Yes, there are problems, but we've been dealing with them in the Bilateral Consultative Commission, which is the implementation uh, body for the treaty. But by and large, the treaty's uh, going well in its implementation. Why was it so quick? It's because we had accumulated already over, at that point, combining INF and START, we had accumulated over 20 years of experience with on-site inspection. So we can take account of the experience of the past in looking forward. And I think we need to do that across the board, whether we're talking about further nuclear reductions, whether we're talking about conventional modernization, conventional arms control modernization, or whether we're talking about developing cooperative ways to work together on uh, missile defenses. Super. Yes, sir. Here's Gordon with the American Association for Advancement of Science. Um, Assistant Secretary Agamo, Acting Deputy Secretary Agamo, you, you mentioned it's a big mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> you mentioned the uh, the two uh, issues uh, from the 1999 Senate action. Uh, my impression was that on, on the other side of that was a uh, a conviction on the part of people who weren't prepared to support the agreement time that it didn't do much for us. You certainly laid that out, but uh, I wonder whether you might want to say a little bit more about sort of how the non-proliferation side and the arms control side sort of fit together, this being a multilateral agreement that, that goes well beyond a, a bilateral uh, operation, and indeed uh, in the context of how the rest of the world sees our non-proliferation responsibilities on the arms control side. Yes, it's, uh, it's important to uh, take note of the, the obligations that come to us as a result of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. And clearly the United States and the other uh, nuclear weapon states under the NPT have an obligation across the board to look for ways to uh, move toward uh, zero nuclear weapons, toward nuclear disarmament. Article 6 of the NPT poses that, uh, that obligation. So there's been a series of, um, I would say, efforts underway since the late 1960s. The NPT itself, of course, with its, uh, its uh, other regime aspects. There have been the bilateral efforts with the Soviet Union and uh, the United States, now Russia and the United States, to reduce uh, and uh, eliminate nuclear weapons. By the way, when a uh, new start entered into force, uh, we had, well, I should say, when it completes its implementation uh, in uh, the next uh, now uh, eight years time, we will be down to 1,550 deployed nuclear warheads. And at the time that uh, START entered into force in 1994, both we and the Russians had approximately close to 12,000 deployed nuclear weapons. So the numbers are coming steadily down and we need to continue with that process. Now moving beyond what's deployed, what's on uh, delivery vehicles, what's on missiles, um, going now next to uh, get at uh, weapons that are non-deployed, held in reserve, held in storage facilities, and also the non-strategic or tactical nuclear weapons as well. So all of those uh, goals have been very important and very consistent uh, over time, although with fits and starts, depending on what the uh, relationship between Moscow and Washington has been. So that's, that's one area that you can see the arms control responsibility have been closely meshed up with the non-proliferation treaty. But there have been two other major multilateral regimes contributing to uh, the goal of uh, nuclear disarmament. The first the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty we successfully negotiated, but we have not yet managed to bring into force. The second, and this is an area that I am working on uh, very, very hard uh, at the Conference on Disarmament, is a fissile material cutoff treaty, a treaty to cut off the production of fissile materials for weapons purposes. And we have been working on that, I feel some days like I'm beating my head against the wall, but we have been working on that very, very hard at the Conference on Disarmament. We are facing an impasse there that's been imposed by a single country, but we are doing everything we can to develop the kind of confidence among all parties at the Conference on Disarmament that they can 
understand that their interests will be dealt with if they come to this negotiating table. So that, uh, we, we've got the prize in terms of the CTBT negotiated. It hasn't been fully delivered because it hasn't entered into force. The next big negotiation is, in this realm, a fissile material cutoff treaty to cut off the production of fissile material for weapons purposes. So we will continue, I don't know if I'm mixing metaphors here, not beating my head on the wall, but rolling rocks uphill in this case, uh, but we will definitely keep, keep at it uh, with regard to, to that goal. So there are a number of ways that we're, we're trying to work together on multiple fronts to ensure not only that the disarmament goals laid out in the Non-Proliferation Treaty are met, but also to ensure that proliferation of nuclear weapons uh, does not occur around the world. And so that uh, also is the effort that is afoot. Uh, it's carried forward in the multilateral realm uh, with, uh, for example, the work of the IAEA with Iran, but it's also, of course, carried forward in special negotiations, such as the P5 plus 1 negotiations that are now ongoing. And by the way, very active discussions uh, ongoing right now uh, up in New York during the UN General Assembly. So we're working all of these problems on various fronts, but, uh, but Pierce is quite right. They're tightly intertwined. And I think we can't lose sight of the fact that what we are doing in working disarmament problems uh, serves the goals uh, laid out in the Non-Proliferation Treaty as well. Yes, sir. I think we're ready for about one more, and then we're going to call it a day. <coughs> Stephen Young with the Union of Scientists. Scientist. Thank you as always, Rose. Um, your workshop is excellent. I have a very detailed, I think important question. Uh, you mentioned several times onset inspections, which worked very well at the start under the INF Treaty. Uh, but one of the um, faults, opponents to the test ban treaty site is the fact that for those inspections of the treaty, we require a majority or two thirds vote of treaty parties. I think the ratio is that say some portion of countries must agree to inspections are demanded. And those are, oh, that would never happen. They would, they would agree to that. Do we have counterexamples already out there where people have agreed? Like, I know we have problems now in Iran where decisions are not being agreed to. Do we have a counterexample of international cooperation where the decisions have happened through large votes that have that? Well, I think one thing I'd like to point to when talking about on site inspection under the treaty <coughs> is uh, this very year we are working uh, in uh, Vienna on preparing for a mock on-site inspection uh, under the CTBT. It's a kind of a preparatory effort. It's part of the, the preparatory efforts for the treaty to enter into force. And uh, I can see, first of all, the very serious technical commitment of all the countries participating to uh, work on establishing the procedures and methods for on-site inspection. That kind of commitment extends to even uh, voluntarily providing <coughs> technical uh, equipment and that type of thing. Countries are working together very, very well. So I don't see any evidence out there that this is kind of what the Russians in the old days used to call it the Temkin village. This is going to be a real on-site inspection capability that develops under the treaty. And I think it will be an important, I think first and foremost, an important deterrent to those who might uh, think that they could get away with a uh, with a uh, an evasive test, so I, I do think it's important to focus in on that uh, important deterrence uh, aspect of this. And as far as speculating about you know whether we get off the ground with an OSI or not, I I, I don't, don't want to speculate on that. I really can't say what's going to happen once the treaty enters into force. But I will say that we will have. A very capable, uh, a very capable OSI uh, procedure and system laid out, to which uh, states will be uh, very accustomed, uh, who are inside the treaty regime, and that in itself, I think, will be very beneficial in bolstering the strength of the deterrence aspect of, of OSI. Let me thank everybody for coming here today and, and visiting ASP. If you hit our website, you'll find uh, all kinds of publications on related topics. We came out with a fact sheet on CTBT this month in particular. Uh, we're holding about an event a month with another one next month on climate change towards the tail end. We're going to release a significant report on it. Uh, 
Rose, we couldn't be more pleased, and we're so honored to have you over here today. And we're, of course, excited and pleased to have you over in the State Department for your leadership. So let's give Rose a big hand.